This is part two of Anna Trent Moore interviewing Peter Cole about his early days and his early days in surfing. Speaking of Greg, I know that the North Shore tribe was a close cadre of men, but yet they're also different. When I say a name, just give me one word that pops into your head about this person. So I'm going to give you a name and just yeah. take your time, yeah. word or two. Pat Kern. Pat Kern was really a stoic, uh, uh, unassuming, quiet, uh, no ego, just a classic uh, gentleman and uh, a funny guy. He, he'd have one-liners that were, uh, he got, he, he, he would sit there, he was a, he was, he would just sit there and wait. And we'd be getting a lot of ways Ricky and I'd be getting maybe 10 waves or so, and we'd be coming back out, and then all of a sudden the wave of the day comes, and there's Pat on it, you know. The only wave he got, but it was the wave of the day. And <clears throat> one day, and I used to, so finally I, I, and I found out where the lineup was. He had the lineup all wired. He told me where the lineup was, and it was, it's still the best lineup. Uh, I told his son about the lineup, and his son was out surfing with me, and this was back in, Oh, maybe 95, 94, when I, when I was still surfing YMA. And he, I told Tommy about it, and Tommy sat there and he couldn't believe how good a lineup it was. He was all stoked, and, and uh, that was Pat's lineup. Uh, but he got this wave, so I, a big set came, and I took off, and I just went airborne, free-falling. I think Bud had it in starting in one of his movies, where I just a total wipeout. And Pat comes paddling by me, and he says, show off. <laughs> so, but Pat was a classic. Fred Van Dyke. Fred was a really a good man. Uh, I, I have to say he's one of my closest friends. And he charged. But he was, you know, it wasn't easy for Fred. He had the, he had the, the short muscles, you know, the tight muscles. And he was a sinker, like if he swam, he sank. And Buzzy was a little bit that way. Hard for them to be swimming because they, they didn't have the floating. It wasn't easy for Fred to float around in the white water and, and everything, and yet he charged. He was out there and he was charging and everything else. And so, in my opinion, he had more guts than anybody had because it wasn't that easy for him. And he was a good man and he was a, a, a great guy and I sure miss him. Butch Van Art Stalen. Butch, Pipeline, Butchie was classic, but he had a drinking problem. And when Bud and I, were, when I was working with Bud, you know, one year we'd have nothing but Butchie getting good Pipeline, Butchie riding and doing, you know, spinning on the waves at Waimea, riding Sunset, going both ambidextrous, riding really well, getting a real good winner. The next winter, the only time you'd see him, he'd be out on a raft drinking, you know. So one winter, he'd get a lot of waves, and the next winter, he'd just be drinking. And uh, eventually, I think the drinking overtook the, the, uh, the riding, and I think that's what did him in. He, it, his, uh, he was a great, I loved Butchie. Uh, people that knew Butchie just loved him. He was, and he was as good a surfer as there was. He was just... At Winnensee, when I the first time I saw him, I couldn't believe how good he was. He was just walking up on the board and walking back and turning and just a natural talent. He was a good athlete. He was an all CIF baseball player and and a whole bunch of things. Jose Angel. Jose Angel, uh, a real waterman. You know they they have this term waterman. That's Jose. Uh, he was a, he swam competitively when he was in college, uh, in high school. He, uh, he, do he could dive 100 feet, 100 feet free diving. He, uh, he was unafraid of anything. I mean, the, w the waves, the wipeouts. Uh, the best wave, one of the best waves I ever had at one I mean, was on his outside. And I took off uh, on this wave, and it's in the film, and he was on my inside, and he, he, he didn't have a prayer of making it. And he did three somersaults in the air, 
and they focused on him because he was just the highlight. It was the highlight of of the films that year, you know. And I just slid out of the film. <laughs> My, one of the best rides I ever had, and it didn't even see me. You just saw Jose going flipping over the, going somersaulting in the air and everything else. And so, he he was a classic. And he'd get a wipeout. He'd be hooting, and he, it wouldn't phase him at all. And uh, he was great. And he surfed Waimea really well. He was really probably the best backside surfer at Waimea at the time. John Peck. John Peck was a great, good surfer, but boy, he loved the cameras. He, uh, he, would, uh, he would be out there. If there were cameras on the beach, boy, John was out there. And so we used to do, a, we did a comedy sequence of that for him in one of Bud's films. But he was a really good surfer. Uh, he was a, uh, his dad, I think, was an admiral or a high office, a high ranking officer at Pearl Harbor when I first met him. And I first met him, he, he came to a surf film and he was all real young and he was tr asking all these questions. And the next thing I knew, he was out in the lineup charging. And uh, he was a really good surfer, especially at, um, st st you know, backside of Pipeline. He really rode that well. Ricky Gregg. Ricky uh, is a renaissance man. Uh, I call him the renaissance man in the set fact that he, he didn't just surf. And when he did surf, he excelled. But he, uh, he was a, ac academically, he was on top of the world. He was big in his field. He was big in the surf. And the first, when I first came over here riding Sunset, I, I think he was number one at Sunset, the way he rode it. He was the one that first started charging and going, fading back and coming back, doing bottom turns and, and really, do, really handling Sunset well. So Ricky was a great surfer, great waterman and great academician, but he was very much into never being wrong. And... Uh, We'd argue all the time, and we had big arguments out in the lineup. People thought we were going to fight or something. We'd be yelling at each other over the Obayashi project. and So I would argue with Ricky quite a bit. What but did you argue about? Mainly the, uh, he, he had this, uh, you know, we had that Obayashi project. They were going to build a road up the side of the cliff, you know, behind the school there, behind the elementary school. They're going to build this road up there. They're going to chop down all these trees. They're going to put in cement. They're going to build uh, houses, put 400 houses up there. They're going to do all this, and it's going to improve the runoff. Ricky, uh, Ricky and the Steve Dollar, and Steve Dollar had an appropriate name because that's what they were doing it for, was for the dollar. You know, they were getting, they were, they were getting paid consultants uh, to, to support the project. And Ricky was saying it, would, it had no runoff and we were, and the surf rider, we were over exaggerating the problem and we were unethical and, and uh, we were, uh, uh, you know, all this stuff. I mean, it was just ridiculous. And so Ricky and I had a big battle over that. And then he wrote something in the newspaper saying how we were, uh, we had no integrity uh, with the way we were exaggerating the, the environment. So we had a few problems with that kind of thing, you know. But other than that, and that was an issue that a lot of people were upset with Ricky on that. Uh, John Kelly. John Kelly was a classic guy. Uh, he uh, he tended to exaggerate. I mean, the, he talks about 50-foot castles and 40-foot waves at castles and how big it is. And and I, he says you you got it says this Waimea and Makaha and Sunset nothing boy. Wait till you see castles, you know. Wait till you see castles on a real big day. So. I get a call when I'm living in Hollywood with my first wife, you know, and I get a call early in the morning and it's John Kelly and he says, get your board. I said, what board should I get? Get the biggest gun you got because Castles is breaking. It's giant. It's big. 
So I get my, I get my brewer out, you know, my 11-4 brewer, and I'm tying it on the car, and I, I go driving into town, and I couldn't believe it. It was 12-foot mush, you know. I mean, it wasn't even, it wasn't even close to what we get on a on a medium day at, at sunset or something. And I could push through the waves, you know. I just, so I, I just figured that it's the old brain, you know. Okay. But he was a classic. He was a, uh, and he was a really good, very bright guy. Uh, he, uh, he was, I think he went to Juilliard or, or something, and he got his doctorate or his master's in music, and he was a musician, and he, I think he was at Palmolive at the, uh, uh, at the, uh, what's that center uh, in Kalihi? Uh, the, uh, Palama. Palama. He worked at the Palama settlement and uh, was one of the original ones and he taught choir there and music. And, uh, he was a, he was an all-around guy and Marion, his wife, was great and he was the first one that we gave the Waterman Trophy to when we were a surf rider. He was a unanimous choice. We were going to have a, a Waterman, uh, the, we were going to uh, give a these trophies and we had the John Kelly Award and he was the first one to get the award. We started that in 98, I think, 99 or 98. And he was there with Miriam and and uh, I had tremendous respect for him for what he did with sur Save Our Surf and uh, uh, other than overestimating the waves, he was great. Buzzy Trent. Buzzy was my was almost family with with Corny and I. Uh, Buzzy started Corny and I surfing. Buzzy and Kit Horn, those two were our very close friends when we grew up in Santa Monica, and uh, they both started us surfing. But Buzzy was a classic. Uh, but our introduction to Buzzy was, we were at we were at Roosevelt Elementary School. I think he was in the fifth grade or sixth grade, and we were in the fifth grade, and. Uh, I knew Buzzy, I knew who he was, he knew who we were, but he was a year ahead of us. And we were playing football, at, I think it was recess or lunch, and he took the football from us. And Corny didn't like that. My twin brother Corny got angry and says, yeah, you can't take the ball from us, it's our ball and all that. And Buzzy said, well, if you don't like it, what are you gonna do about it? He said, well, I don't know, but I think we should have this. So they, they were gonna meet in a lot outside the elementary school, they were going to meet and fight. Well, Kit Horn was there with Buzzy, and I was there with Corny, and it was a total, I mean, I told Corny he was nuts. He was totally insane. I mean, Buzzy was, even at that age, Buzzy was nothing but muscle, and he was a tough hombre. Buzzy was always really tough. I mean, if you had Buzzy on your side, you you didn't care about who was around. You you were safe because he was he was the strongest, toughest guy I've ever known, and he just had Corny. He Corny down on the ground. Corny get up. He Corny go down on the ground. Corny get up. Finally, Buzzy grabs Corny and hugs Corny. And says, I, "Let's stop. This is ridiculous. Let's stop." Corny's bleeding and all that stuff. It was really funny because from that point on, Buzzy and Cor Kit and Corny and I were best of friends. We just, we we were best all the way through. When we'd go to Lincoln, we'd go, we'd bicycle together out to Lincoln, and uh, when we went to Samo High, we'd get on the bus together, and we were just always together. and And it was really a a good knowing Buzzy was just a classic, and what a charisma. What a, what a, when Buzzy would tell a story, he would, everybody would be uh, hanging around him and listening and, and uh, he, he, he was, he was one of a kind and you should be very proud of your dad. He was great. George Downey. George was stoic and uh, Buzzy called him the desert fox. You know the guy Rummel, is it the German, the uh, the, the German uh, general. general? You know that was so was so uh, successful as a as a fighter during the, and Buzzy loved 
to follow the guys that were big fighters. And so he always called Buzzy the Desert Fox after Rummel, I think, because uh, he called George uh, the Desert Fox because George was always the guy that knew when the light, where, the, where the lineup was, knew when the waves were going to come. Just bright. When it came to the ocean, George was a genius, you know? I don't think I've ever known a guy that knows the ocean any better than George. And uh, he just was and he a fluid surfer. And I think in my age group, the two best surfers in my age group, uh, Buzzy was real good, but he had his, his style was trimming and everything else. But the best all around surfers of my age group were George Downing in Hawaii and Matt Kivlin in, in California. And I don't think anybody touched those two as far as all around surfing goes uh, back in those days. That was be in the 40s and early 50s. Yeah. You miss surfing big waves, Peter? Oh yeah, I miss surfing. I, I do. I, well, I stopped surfing YMA in 95, uh, Thanksgiving in 95, and, uh, but I surfed Sunset until I, my shoulder, I couldn't surf anymore. Uh, but, and that was in 2006, was the last time I surfed Sunset. And then I miss the, I miss, I almost miss Sunset more than YMA because it, it's a more dynamic wave, it's more consistent, you get a lot more surf, and there was a camaraderie out there. Uh, I always call it the San Onofre of the, of the North Shore because it, it had an older group. You know, San Onofre is where all these old guys hang around in California and surf straight off and all that stuff. Well, I used to refer to Sunset as the, as the uh, San Onofre of the North Shore because it had all this older group. The average age in the lineup at Sunset on a given day when I was at the end when I was surfing was much older than most lineups. I mean, it was an older group. And it was fun. Uh, it was every guy out there was a good waterman, and we had a lot of fun. We we'd spend more time talking almost than we would surfing. You know, we talk story. We we gave we give each other a bad time. We used to give Ken Bradshaw a really bad time because he was going out with uh, Lane Beachley, who was this woman top Australian surfer. She was the best at the time and. We used to ask him, well, how does it feel to be going out with a, somebody that surfs better than you, you know? <laughs> and uh, that used to kill Ken, cause, but it was, we used to have a lot of fun. We'd, uh, Ken used to tell me how many waves he got, because he knew I never got any. Uh, he'd get more waves in one session than I got in the whole winter, you know? But he would, he would just tell me, ah, this is... I got this my number 30th wave and so forth, you know. Well, it would bother me, but not too much, you know, because I sat and tried to wait for the better waves. And I always went on the idea that one good wave is better than 100 bad waves, but he got the good waves as well. But one day he was out there body surfing because he had a bad shoulder or something, or he had, he had some kind of injury, so he was out body surfing. And he comes over and he says, well, I've had 20 waves. <laughs> that, was the, that was the crowning blow. I'll never forget that. But uh, yeah, he's he's a classic uh, waterman, and he's in great shape still, surfing. And he's got a great wife, Mandy, and he's got a little girl, and uh, Zoe, and and I see him all the time on the bike on the bikeway, and uh, he hasn't changed, and uh, he knows more about what day was good, what date it was, when it was, because he charts. He builds a chart on all this stuff. So if I say, what day was that? And he said, oh, that was November 4th, uh, 1967 or 68 or something. You know, I mean, he he has all that stuff wired. And and, uh, he, he's, uh, and he's a full-on waterman. What is a waterman to you? A guy that, that can, well, a guy that can free dive, a guy that can swim, a guy that's comfortable in the ocean, and a guy that can ride sunset, you know? Now, if you ride Rincon, you know, and that's all you do is ride Rincon, and you're good at Rincon, or you're good at Malibu, you're not what I would call a waterman. But if you can ride sunset, where there's a dynamic wave, and, and it's peaky, and it's hard to line up, and it's shifty, and it's, 
a guy that really knows the ocean, knows the water, and feels comfortable in the water, and uh, uh, and free dives or or swims. Good. I think a, a waterman has to be able to swim in if he loses his board. You know. Uh, so you've got all those elements. Uh, I don't consider myself a waterman because I, d I never free dove. I never did diving because I couldn't see. You know, I was I'm nearsighted. And those fish, lobsters and squid and everything scare the hell out of me. I don't want to have anything to do with those things. Um, when I was with Buzzy, years ago, Buzzy was out there with this lifeguard, um, this, uh, uh, and they were out uh, fishing or diving uh, out on, a, and they had a big, inner tube and everything, and they had lobsters, and they were getting lobsters and throwing lobsters in there, and they asked me to watch the lobsters. And, the, and I was sitting on the raft, holding the raft, and this lobster came out and jumped at me, you know? And I went, oh, and I, all the lobsters that were in the raft went falling in the ocean. Boy, they were so angry at me and everything. So I just didn't want to have anything to do with those kinds of things in the water, so I never free dove. And I think the guys that were really, real watermen, like Pat Kern and Fred would free dive, uh, Jose free dive, Buzzy. Those guys were free divers, and Ricky. Those guys were real watermen because they could free dive. A guy that is a real waterman now is this kid, uh, uh, Mark Healy. Mark Healy is a really good uh, free diver, good surfer, charges big waves. So I'd call that a waterman. And uh, Brock Little was a waterman. And it's a sad thing to see him have such a bad cancer and die at such an early age, but he was a real charger. You live here on a rocky point with a great porch overlooking the water. And every winter when the big surf comes and you look out at it, what do you think? Well, you know, what, what really gets me down is when I see it, the, when I see it coming out of the north-northwest and coming off the point at, at sunset, and it's got that horseshoe in the middle, and it's got that long wall. I don't like the west. The west is, it comes in, it just, it hug, it makes everybody line up in one area, because that's where you have to take off, and that's the only spot where you go, and you don't get a real wall. But it comes out of the north-northwest, it's really a good wave, and when I see that, and I see it, and, I, and it, it, at around noon or so, and it's 10 or 12 feet, and it's coming out of that direction, it doesn't look too crowded, that's when I really get, that's when I get depressed, because I'd, I'd like to just grab my board, shoot out there. And in fact, I did that about five years ago. I couldn't stand it, and I went out there, and I had a horrible time. I was just a total kook, you know. And surfing is a funny deal. You start off a kook, you go full circle and you end up a kook so as you get older. And that's, that's when I decided this is ridiculous. I'm dangerous out here. Uh, I lost my board a few times and it went through the lineup and wiped out a few people. And I thought, well, this, is, this isn't, I can't do this anymore. So I quit. What are you most proud of? Having a nice family, or number one. Uh, and I think... Uh, I think being a, a being considered a you know being considered that I I rode the, I rode sur I surfed uh, the North Shore and I put in as many years on the North Shore surfing as anybody and I'm proud of all those years and I'm proud of the people I kn knew the camaraderie in the lineup uh, and I miss that I miss a lot of the surfing uh, miss not just the riding of the waves, but the people you're hanging around with and everything. Surfing is a great sport. You're out in the lineup, you, you have a beautiful environment. Every place you surf, I don't if it's on the mainland or here, if you think of all the better places to surf, they're always in an ideal, beautiful area. You know, the coastline is beautiful. I mean, there's no more beautiful beach than you get at Rincon or Malibu or Overhead. Or wind and sea. I mean, you've got, you've got an environment there that's beautiful. And then you come over and Steamer Lane, I mean, you can't get that, that cliffs and everything. <coughs> you can't beat that. And 
over here, if you think of all the surf spots, Waimea is just beautiful. You're out in the lineup and you're looking into the valley and you're looking at that at that church steeple and and you're looking at all this stuff. You're looking up and down the coast. Sunset is beautiful. Uh, and Makaha is beautiful. Joshua, big big surf, point surf at Makaha when you're sitting out there and you're seeing these waves coming in off the Kaina Point. There's nothing more beautiful and, and wonderful than surfing big waves. It's just... It's something that that you you just uh, and Buzzy's probably told you all about this too and uh, and George, I mean we we've had we've had our our wonderful times out there surfing and it's just it's been the highlight of I think probably the most fun I've ever had on surfing has been on certain days when I had a good day I rode well. I got good ways, and I was just really happy. You know, I came home. I come home, and uh, Sally could always tell when I had a good day and a bad day. When I came home, and I was real grumpy and just giving it, uh, just really grumpy. I had a bad day, you know, nothing but swims. I lost my board. I swam in. I got my board. I went out, swam in, lost my board. I mean, just a horrible day. And then another day, I'd go out, and I'd get three or four good rides, Never got more than about four good rides. I, I never was much for quantity. And uh, I'd come home, I'd be real happy and cheerful. And so it, it, it's a hard thing to give up. And I still get really depressed when I see it glassy and nice and good conditions and not crowded. Of course, that is, it doesn't happen very often. It's usually crowded. And so that's one good thing. It's much more crowded now than it used to be. Oh yeah, I I tell everybody I'm glad I'm as old as I am, because uh, in a way I think we had the best. You know, we we had the we had the introduction to this to the balsa chip boards. We had the introduction to the <coughs> the fiberglass, the concaves. We were there before Gidget. You know, we had the best day. We had days at Malibu when it was hitting the pier, beautiful waves. And we had 10 or 12 people out. I mean, just beautiful surf, you know. And I can remember days, uh, I can remember surfing Steamer Lane. Uh, there was this one day, 1953, January 10th. It's one of the biggest days that hit California. It was the day that Ricky surfed Rincon with Matt and Quig and all those guys, and they got real big Rincon. Well, I, got, I went out at Steamer Lane by myself, uh, and I got a reform. I tried to get out to where the waves were breaking way outside, but it was getting late and it was taking so long to go out through the the current was just coming in. So I went to the regular lineup and it was good because I got a reform that broke way outside. It was white water way outside and it reformed in the regular lineup and it was a solid 12, 15 foot wave. Uh, and it was just unbelievable classic wave and it just connected all the way and I was all the way it looked like I was going to make it to the pier you know it's at at Santa Cruz at I got past Cowles I was halfway in the bay and I and I had to straighten out because it closed out kind of in the middle there but if I could have gotten through that section and gone all the way to the pier that would have been I mean that was the best wave I've ever had in California and then I had a wave at sunset on a good day when Kimo Hanja got us out there that to this day was the best day wave I've ever had in, in, in Hawaii. And so those were the highlights of my life. And then I got a big wave in October of 69 at Waimea that was the biggest wave I ever rode. So those three waves stand out in my, my life for California, for Sunset, and for Waimea. And, and those were hard to beat. And then a wave I got at, outside Lania Kea on a big day was pretty exciting. Uh, I, Makaha, I got big waves in Makaha, but I never could make the doggone bowl because I always would do a sunset beach bottom turn. And you're not supposed to. You're supposed to go on an angle trimming. And Buzzy and George would get really impatient when they say, why do you do that? And I said, well, I was just so, it was so natural. For, if I got a big wave to go down to the bottom and make a bottom turn and come around, and I never made the bowl. I think I, I always was getting caught in the bowl. So... Um, 
I'd see Buzzy and George making these beautiful waves across, you know, and here I am swimming in the bowl and getting caught in the bowl. And so, so I, I didn't get as excited about Makaha as Buzzy did because I didn't ride it that well. But Sunset was my pet. That, that was what I loved. Last but not least, what would you like people to remember most about Peter Cole? Oh, well, that I didn't snake people, you know, that I, I shared, you know, that I, 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 I tried to be on the inside. I tried not to ride on the outside, but then I, my kids would give me a bad time because I'd take off and there'd be a guy on my inside I didn't see. So I'd, I didn't even see the guy. I didn't even know he was there because I'm so blind. But uh, I think... I think just having good friends, having respect, you know, and and this is a real honor to be, uh, I, I don't know why you're doing this, uh, I'm still alive, you know. <laughs> you, usually you wait until you die before you do any of them. So, uh, in fact, people kept wondering, people were talking in town and saying, is Peter all right and all that stuff, you know? Is he okay? And they thought that because of this, that maybe I was dying or something. And you were having this thing because I was dying and it was going to be the end, you know? But that's, that's, a, that's here nor there. Well, I hope after seeing it, they see you're kicking and alive and very well. Well, I think I'll be alive a long time, as long as Max keeps me going. Okay, Peter, I think that's a wrap. Aloha. <laughs> well, I hope you got something on there. <laughs>